We have, as, uh, as Chris mentioned, an illustrious panel to take us through uh, this uh, debate today, so uh, we'll hopefully get a bit of a debate going. What I would like to say, though, is we are going to use the app for questions, so if any questions come up that you'd like to ask during the debate, please just send them straight through. We'll try and answer them at the end. Um, if any of them look particularly special, we might pick them out during the debate as well and introduce them to the panel. Uh, what, um, what I'd like to do first, John has very kindly introduced me, I'd like the panel just to introduce themselves so we know who everybody is. Give us a bit of background. So, uh, James, over to you. Okay, thank you. My name is James Bland. I head up the Hotels Insights team at BDRC. You've probably just seen a flavour of what it is we do. Um, and on top of that, we're currently getting our head around a very exciting data set of global passengers from a, a study that we're doing in, in collaboration with a technology partner. So, more to come uh, possibly next year. Interesting. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm John Brennan, Chief Executive Officer of Amaris Hospitality. Uh, it's a wholly owned business of Lone Star Funds, relatively new, founded in 2015. We have approximately 70 hotels in the UK and Ireland. Uh, we have our own brand, Jury's Inn, and we also operate other hotels under Accor Brands and the Hilton Brands. Thanks, John. Good afternoon. I'm Christopher Michaud. Um, I'm in charge of the hotel relationship at Expedia, so managing all the relationship with the major hotel brands uh, across the world. Uh, and I'm excited to be there today uh, to really talk around how can we help the hotel industry uh, through our investment in technology that we do uh, everywhere. Thanks, Chris. Tim Walton, I'm with Marriott. I oversee the company's development activities across Western Europe, and that includes uh, the UK. Um, subsequent to the closing of the, the transaction to acquire Starwood Hotels and Resorts about 12 months ago, we're, we're now just over, I think, 6,200 hotels globally, uh, of which there are 85 here in the UK. Um, we'll be opening another 10 hotels, I think, this year, by the end of the year, uh, which represents a high watermark for us in terms of openings. And the emphasis of our business has really shifted over the last few years, particularly here in Europe and um, specifically here in the UK. So if you look at the majority of the estate of our hotels today, uh, the large majority is, is managed by, by Marriott. That, that is evolving. And if I look at the pipeline of hotels across Europe today, the vast majority is, is franchise. So our business model is shifting. We're, we're still managing, but franchising is really our, our biggest growth vehicle. And it's more skewed towards sort of budget limited service type operations as well. Changes afoot. Thanks, Tim. Cheers. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, launch in with our first topic. Um, imagine we are an owner of a hotel, a practical situation for a number of you in the room, I, I, I'm aware. <coughs> Brands bring us a customer base, a profile in the market, and also a cost. We pay royalty fees, reservations fees, etc. And in some cases, as we saw on the slide earlier on, this is not necessarily a cheap exercise. On the other hand, we have online distributors, that have a huge presence uh, in the public's mind, as we saw. But that comes at a cost as well, with commissions quite often running well into double digits. So, Chris, I'd like to pose the first question to you, if that's okay. Given that the BDRC research showed quite a high proportion of online bookings were actually delivered by non-inventory owning websites, would it be realistic of me as an owner to place all of my distribution requirements in your hands? And if so, what type of hotel in what location is going to work best from that perspective? I, I would love to, uh, to have all <laughs> the distribution for sure, but I think that wouldn't be realistic. Uh, I think the way we, we perceive ourselves, uh, you know, really is obviously we also have a collection of brands. Uh, we have different brands uh, that we work with. Expedia is really the full brand of travel where you can purchase anything, including train now uh, as well, uh, for all your travel needs. Hotels.com, that is only a brand that only sells hotel and that's it. And then the GNCF, for example, that is obviously our corporate travel brand, uh, really more tailor-made with more services to the corporate travelers. And with all those brands, we really see them as a platform for the hotels to really target uh, based on the needs uh, of what we can bring. Obviously, any hotels, whether it's a brand or a non-brand, uh, you know, we re-offering that choice to the consumers. And when the, when the hotels are partnering with us, you know, we can really help them to target uh, the business that they need. So obviously, if you're in Manchester, you probably need more business over the weekend. What if you're in Amsterdam? That's probably the other way around, where you're trying to attract more business traveler uh, than really leisure travel on the weekends, uh, city being most of the time full there. 
So it's really about how are we going to work together based on the situation, whether you have a brand or not a brand, because really our consumers are brand agnostic. Uh, we've actually did research uh, and, uh, you know, in the, on our sites, on our different sites, you can actually filter by hotel name. And it's less than 0.5% of the consumers that are actually putting, using that feature on our site. Um, that really shows how consumers are shopping around and looking for just the right product that they're looking for at the right time. Interesting. Thank you. Tim, you mentioned the merger uh, earlier on, a um, bit of corporate activity earlier this year. But I think now you have 30 brands, two loyalty programs, presumably becoming one, and a host of operational skill. Does that mean that you can now provide a solution to all owners, or do brands not necessarily work in every location? Um, we're 30 brands today. If I was a betting man, I would think that by this time next year, we would probably have more brands in the stable. I mean, that's just my view, not a house view. Um, so I think there's more room. Um, and um, uh, I'm, candidly, I, I don't think there is a branded solution for every hotel. I mean, um, a lot of the time that I spend as a developer is actually separating the wheat from the chaff and what is deliverable from, from what's not deliverable in terms of a branded product. I mean, there, there are hotels that are simply too small um, to be economic, either for us or for the owner. Uh, and if it doesn't work economically, it simply doesn't work. Um, there are hotels that are intrinsically unbrandable because with the best will in the world and with a large, um, um, uh, with a, a spectrum of brands to choose from, um, the, the requirements will never meet the, uh, the, the needs of the brand. Um, and I think if we're, we're honest with ourselves as well, there are certain situations where a brand simply doesn't work. Um, not just our brand, but, but any brand. Um, and I think sometimes we've learned the hard way that actually brands, it's not a panacea. It, it doesn't work in every situation. And I think we, we have to be disciplined with ourselves when it comes to looking at new hotel opportunities uh, and new opportunities to, to, to grow our brands to, to make sure that they're the right opportunities. Um, so, no, uh, I, I don't think there is a branded solution for every hotel. No, okay. I mean, it sounds as though potentially there's a, there's a position, therefore, for... Um, the likes of Expedia, Booking.com, to be providing or to filling in that gap, either whether it's a locational gap or whether it's a, a style of hotel, that actually means that a, an owner can benefit from, uh, from a greater level of distribution by, by tying up with somebody like Expedia. Would you say that that, that would be the case, Chris? Well, I think the, uh, you know, uh, again, when you look at the consumers, what they're really looking for is choice. And, you know, today one of the things we offer when you come into our sites is, you can search to, uh, across 450,000 hotels across the world. So it's really that choice that obviously even Marriott with the brands wouldn't be able to provide to the consumers. And again, our consumers are more led by, you know, I have a problem to solve as we were talking about before. And, you know, I'm really looking for, you know, whether it would be a big brand hotel in the city center for a business trip or, you know, one of these cottage uh, across the UK just to go on a weekend escape. So it, you know, the visibility we provide, uh, obviously, will also be of value to the, to the chains. Um, you know, one of the things that we today sell in 70 countries, and obviously within those 70 countries, we are able to operate in the local language, uh, get the local payment solutions like, uh, you know, in Brazil where they're paying in, with installments, um, and obviously service the customers in their own language as well. Uh, and so that's really, really important to offer that diversity to the consumers in order to help them to solve that problem that they have at that time. Interesting. Thank you very much. John, I'd like to bring you into the debate at this point. You obviously run an organization that has um, hotels of different brands. Uh, you also have responsibility for some hotels which are non-branded. Uh, and in the past uh, year or so, you've been taking decisions about shifting brands from one to the other. From, a, from an owner's point of view, what are the key things that you're looking at and thinking about uh, when, you're, when you're making those brand or non-brand decisions? I think, uh, well, going back to 2015, we had nearly 100 hotels to, uh, to assess. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, it was all about return on investment, return on capital, right? So, you know, revenue premium, I, mean, I think a big brand will always deliver you a certain amount of revenue premium, I think, in, in most, you know, urban locations at least. But, but revenue premium in and of itself is of no great value to an investor, right? But what, what you need is you need profit premium. Mm. 
and how do you get profit premium? So that includes an assessment of the capex uh, involved, an assessment of the amount of premium you can get in rate, an assessment of the costs of operation, cost of distribution, and ultimately then a decision around what works best. And I think one of the things that certainly I've learned over the last number of years, it's very location specific. And if I take three hotels that we looked at out of this hundred and give you an example, Ligon Arms in, in the Cotswolds, uh, the Thistle uh, Brighton Waterfront, uh, and the hotel collection Carlton Hotel in, in Edinburgh. So all three of them uh, very different, but all in good locations. The Ligon Arms, we said to ourselves, you know, that A can't be a, a brand in our opinion and actually should really be an independent hotel. Uh, and we sold it as an independent hotel to somebody who's looked after it and turned it into a, a very uh, nice property. It's always been a great property, but it needed capex. But that cap capex was not actually at a return on investment that worked for us. The uh, Brighton Waterfront uh, Thistle Hotel, uh, you know, could have been a great uh, Marriott or a great Hilton or whatever. But frankly, there wasn't enough uplift in it. It was already the rate leader in the city. So we turned it into a jury's inn. You know, it, you would think that that should have a diminution of, of rate. It didn't. The hotel's actually, you know, post-renovation continues to be the rate leader in Brighton. And then thirdly, the Hilton Carlton in Edinburgh, which we turned into a core brand, Hilton, uh, spent a very large amount of money on it. And it's done phenomenally well uh, in terms of, of rate premium and uh, uh, occupancy premium uh, based on we could have made it a, a juries, but, but then juries for us has to have a certain DNA in its brand. But equally, uh, it, could, it was able to do that much better by the extra investment and the extra brand. And as I say, it's very location specific and it's very return specific. And in the location, what we really look for is bandwidth and rate. If there isn't enough bandwidth in rate, you're never going to get the premium in return. I.e., if, if the rates at the five-star level are already low, and there's a relatively small gap between, let's say, full-service four-star and premium five-star, then it doesn't, generally speaking, make a lot of sense to, to rebrand to an international brand, because the cost of running our own brand, juries, is significantly lower than running uh, an international brand. Yeah. So, the, so those brands have got to prove their worth at the EBITDA line. That's this effectively the, the critical uh, Not even the EBITDA point. line, the return on capital line. Right. Because EBITDA in and of itself doesn't, you know, you've got to still put in your X amount of millions to invest in it. And if there's a premium X millions to go in in the capital investments, the EBITDA still might be better, but the return on capital may not be better. Sure. James, um, would you say that uh, with technology companies evolving their products and their capabilities, do you foresee a point where the brands may die? No. Short answer. Short answer. <laughs> um, simply, brands continue to drive choice and influence consumer decisions. So, uh, Chris used the, the line of cognitive misers, and it's absolutely true. You can go onto Expedia, and you can search, and you can produce a list of hotels. You might not be looking for a specific name, but straight away, those brands will tell you something about what you can expect from those properties, and it's a shortcut. Now, whether you select them, whether the brand image is good or bad is uh, dependent on how well the brand is managed, but there is still that advantage when it comes to selection. There is still a rate uplift. Whether that falls through to the bottom line is down to another or a number of other factors, but no, the brands won't die, and we will see more brands, not fewer. So I think we'd, we're certainly getting the, the view, really, that the, the debate has moved beyond well beyond the sort of brand versus brand or van, brand versus not brand, and it's now moving into the territory of uh, a, a sort of tie-up between brands and technology partners and distribution channels like Expedia.com. Um, this is the landscape that's here to stay, really. It is, and that the brand promise has got to evolve. One of the original drivers for brands, I suppose, is wherever you go, it's something you know, it's familiar, it's uh, a taste of home. That construct of itself has become toxic to many travellers. They like going into the unknown. So the brand promise has to evolve into a minimum standard below which you know that the service isn't going to fall. So the brands have to demonstrate that while still being locally connected, still offering something that's authentic, allowing you to see the, the real Manchester, whatever that might be, whether it's City or United. Um, and as a result, we are seeing uh, travel brands and intermediaries being seen by the consumer as brands in their own right. There's the reviews, the ratings, uh, and they get mentions comparable to many of the domestic brands when asked to name hotel brands. Consumers are, are putting them up there. 
So it, it, it does seem as though the challenge remains one of balancing the opportunities of each branding or distribution opportunity, as, as, uh, as John alluded to, with the specific circumstances of the asset management team, I guess, as well, and, and also the market that it's in. And I guess that part of this, in terms of the technology, will have been at the forefront of Accor's thinking with its uh, recent technology acquisitions. We saw, we saw the Gecko acquisition last week, which was announced, but there have been others. And Accor aren't the only company that's investing in, in technology. Um, we're also aware, though, and it's, uh, it's fantastic that we've got the two companies on, represented on the stage of, of, an, of a tie-up between Marriott and Expedia on this front. <laughs> And Tim, I just wondered if you could share with us how, how Marriott is collaborating uh, on the technology front with, with a, an organization that would probably have been on the other side of the debate um, only a few years ago. Sure. So, I mean, in, in some ways, clearly, we, we still compete um, with Expedia and, and, and their brethren for, for, for the customer and, and, and for the channel. And we, we continue to invest heavily in Marriott.com to... Um, to incentivize our members that Chris was talking about and to incentivize others through kind of depth of material available on our proprietary site to, to use our site. Um, so in some ways, clearly, we're still in competition. Um, but in other ways, it's quite collaborative, the relationship. So um, not just with Expedia. So bookings.com actually power our um, Italian and, and Turkish language websites, which has been a great tool for us. They did the same in... Russia until a couple of years ago when we launched our own proprietary Russian language site. Um, we entered into a JV, as you know, with Alibaba, which again, I think underpins that sort of collaboration. Specifically in terms of Expedia, we launched, um, I guess about 12 months ago now, um, Vacations by Marriott, um, whereby you can go on to the Marriott website and um, using Expedia technology, you can book a, a full package for your holiday. So you can book the accommodation, you can book the flights, you can book the ground transportation, you can book a theater ticket and experience. And um, you know, what, what that does is several things. Clearly, it makes it very convenient for, uh, for the customer. Um, and again, this is a joint initiative between us and, and our partners at Expedia. Um, but also, interestingly, we find on these packages that the cancellation rate is a lot lower, um, and the, the, the booking window is, is a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And I think to, to Chris's earlier point as well, you know, people don't want to have to think too much about it. So they can go on, they can book everything all at once, and, and then they're done. Um, so it, it works to our benefit, to our partners at Expedia's benefit, and also we think to the customer's benefit as well. Sure. And, and um, Chris, is this... Is this something that you will see more of, or we will see more of within the sector, is, is a partnering between uh, brands and technology houses in order to deliver exactly the kind of uh, booking experience that Tim has just been, just been describing? Yeah, absolutely. I think, look, if, if I can draw a parallel to this, uh, if you look at what Amazon did uh, a couple of years back, they've created this massive infrastructure, because obviously they're the largest retail company in the world, and they've created this massive infra technology infrastructure to make sure the site is up and running 24-7 with a minimal uh, response time, right? And that led to the creation of a division called Amazon Web Services, which is all the cloud technology that they, they're using. Actually, we are uh, migrating all our servers, our farm of servers, into the cloud of Amazon because they provide definitely a better uh, response time and up and running time of all our servers than what we can do effectively. And I think, you know, uh, when we looked at, uh, um, you know, a year and a half ago, when we looked at, obviously, we are pretty good at giving marketing and distribution uh, to the hotel partners. But in the meantime, we are also investing about $1.3 billion a year in technology. And obviously, that will be way more than any other hotel chains. Um, and when you look at, you know, when we're talking to the hotel chains, when we're talking to the independent hotel, what is it, when you look at the cost of technology, usually the answers you're getting is, I just replatform everything and have to redo it again now. Because now the size of the screen has changed, or there's this new device coming up, or this new technology that just came up. And as obviously this is one of our core business to invest in that technology, we looked at how can we leverage those investments that we're making to make sure we help the hotel industry to be more efficient when it comes to technology. So it's not specifically a competition because uh, you know, when we invest $1.3 billion, we know that we can leverage it, those investments to also make this uh, industry more efficient. So the example of Marriott is one of those examples where, you know, you have consumers coming to the site, 
they might be looking for a hotel, but if suddenly they realize, oh, I can actually book a package with everything in there, um, you know, good flight, uh, obviously good technology that will allow me to have a transaction that is pretty fluid, then that's where we can leverage that technology. Uh, another example of that is uh, our MICE product. So we uh, recently launched, finally in English, about a year ago in German, a product that allows to book online small meetings and events. Not big one like this, but you know, when you look at about 70% of the market is made of, I need a conference room for two days for 30 people with a couple of bedrooms and a screen and a breakfast, uh, breakfast, et cetera. All those items that we can now uh, you know, provide the technology for the hotel chains to uh, put that live on the site. And again, this is how we are leveraging our investment uh, in order to help the hotel industry. I mean, that's key. key. Last year at this conference, Trevor Williams said that uh, international trade benefits everybody. He sort of repeated it again. Just because two countries can produce the same goods, they actually are generally better if they focus on one and focus on what they're best on. And I think to a certain extent, the same could be true with the investment in technology that Expedia have made. Hotels can't keep up with that. Hotel groups, even the big ones, can't spend all that because they have other things to do, like running hotels and managing brands and so on. So if there is an opportunity for collaboration, then it's possible that both parties could benefit. And the Marriott Expedia type has always interested me. It looks to me like instead of focusing on the war for the customer, they've been taking a look at who's going to win the piece. I guess the, 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 uh, the technology companies have the power in terms of capital raising, which sometimes hospitality companies may, may not, um, and also in terms of speed to market of product. Um, so you, you're, you're able by um, collaborating to tap into those two elements which the technology companies are really taking advantage of. John, is there, is there any, anything that... Well, I think if you, if you look at what's happened over the last, let's say, five, seven years in terms of this particular space, I mean, I think, you know, we, we talk about, you know, frenemies and, and uh, the, our, our friends in the OTA community, and, and it kind of is because on the one hand, we, we want to try and keep our relationship with our customers. And we want to try and build our relationship with our customers because uh, we think that that's, that's, that's the relevant thing to do. On the other hand, if I look at our juries in business over the last uh, period of time, what's happened? So what's happened is that the distribution has moved more to OTAs, but not necessarily away from direct web. Direct web has actually also grown. What's actually happened is that some of the other distribution channels have changed. And in reality, a small brand like ours, a non-global brand, has in effect moved away from large quantities of fixed price bulk business to far more transient business that's driven to a large extent by OTAs. We wouldn't be able to go to market in a cost-effective way on a global basis as a brand of our size. So yes, we're paying more in distribution costs, but actually the combination of the higher average room rate the more dynamic pricing, you end up actually with a better business mix and ultimately a higher profitability level for the business. And so I suppose it, there's going to be a continuous evolution of that relationship as we go forward. Uh, and clearly, you know, the, the, the OTA landscape uh, in terms of technology investment is, is continuing to power ahead. Uh, it's sh showing some signs of, of slowing, at least in terms of growth. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's still there and we need to find a way to work eff effectively together to get the ultimately the best business solution, uh, speaking as a hotel owner, but, but also from a customer perspective, the best choice, the best customer experience. So there's, a, there's an optimal position that we're still searching for then, that we, we're going to get to, which sounds good. We've got some, got some questions which have come through, and we're, we're looking as though we're getting a bit uh, tight on time. I'm looking at Jonathan there. Have we got time to take any questions, Jonathan? We've got one question. I'll look at that first one if you want. I'll, uh, so we're, we're going we're gonna to take a look at the first one. If the number of brands are to increase and the brand operators are to create these brands, at what point do brands within a portfolio become too similar and differentiation too small for the consumer to conceive or appreciate? At that point, the number of brands then have to condense. Well, it started to happen now. And no, the brands won't condense. There will just be more brands. So there is one brand that Chris mentioned in his presentation. It has a sibling. They are very similarly named, although they operate in different tiers. Consumer can't tell them apart, cannot tell the difference, doesn't know if they've stayed in one or the other. So the response from that group hasn't been to remove one of them because they'd never get their owners to agree to that. The response has been to launch something else in that space to make a differentiation, a point of difference. So that point is now. There are many brands that are quite similar and indistinguishable, and it is just fueling further additional new brands. It's not going to result in, a, in condensing of the overall total. 
Interesting. So we're going to see more brands. They're going to continue to come through. We're going to see greater collaboration between the technology world and, and the hospitality space and ultimately looking to drive higher returns for, hopefully, for the owners and the lenders and give a better guest experience as well. Thank you very much to the panel. Uh, it's been a pleasure coming here this afternoon and uh, wish you the best for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.